I'm Charlotte McLeod with the Investing News Network, and here today with me is Gary Wagner. He's executive producer at thegoldforecast.com, and he's also a regular contributor to Kitco News. Thank you so much for joining me online today. It's great to see you. Thank you for having me, and a pleasure to work with you again. It's been about a year, huh? It has. You know, time goes by so quickly, but it's great to have you back. And I think we're talking on a good day because we did just get the latest CPI data this morning. Let's start there and get your thoughts on what we saw. What points would you pull out for investors to notice? Well, first of all, the numbers came in very close to expectations, which is why we didn't see tremendous moves in the financial markets almost across the board. We came in at 6.4. The only unusual thing is that that increase of 5% month over month is the biggest differential since June of 2022. So it's certainly not showing that inflation is greatly reducing at a rapid pace. My takeaway from it is when you combine today's report with the jobs report, which came in over 500,000 with an expectation of 288, it shows that the economy is still running at least on six or seven out of eight cylinders. It's strong. And the Federal Reserve's greatest fear is that these rate hikes, and when we consider that they had seven out of seven rate hikes last year, March to December, every FOMC meeting, we had one in January. I now expect one quarter percent rate hike in March, um, that the economy is still standing. And so it gives people a lot of hope that we could see a soft landing, or if we do have a recession, it won't be as terrible as for first perceived. So that's the good takeaway about it. Um, the other thing that I think is important is there is always going to be an intrinsic lag in between when they raise rates and when you kind of see how it affects the economy. And so I believe that after March, it is highly likely, all things being equal, that the Fed will pause at least for one meeting to see what happens over a two month period because to just raise rates a consecutive, consecutive, consecutive and not see that lag effect because just the rates that have already been raised will continue to work themselves through the economy. They don't know where it will have inevitably go. And they need to, at some point, take a pause and reflect on what effect they have had. Okay, I think we've got a lot of different things to unpack there. So you've given us a good look at what you see coming from the Fed. So in its upcoming meeting, another 25 basis point hike, then after that, a pause. So mm -hmm. you mentioned people thinking that maybe there's a chance of this soft landing. What do you think? Do you think that's a justified expectation? I'm on the fence. If you would have asked me a month ago, I would have said it's it's not possible to contract the economy at the accelerated pace they have and not it and not have it lead to a recession. Historically speaking, that's never happened. We've never had a Fed have an aggressive monetary policy to reduce inflation. And the definition of reducing inflation is contracting the economy. The definition of a recession is an economic contraction for two consecutive quarters. So it's kind of a quagmire or it's something that shouldn't happen. I am on the fence. I think it's possible, but I do believe it's still unlikely that there won't be some sort of kickback. The other thing that we have to realize is they revised the December numbers. They first came out indicating a reduction in inflation, and the revision now shows that inflation actually grew in December, which beckons the question, should we be focused on the revision of today's numbers or do we take them as they are? And that's something I can't answer, but it's something that I'll pose as a important factor in where we go from here. So people really keep a close eye on things like inflation numbers because that influences the Fed, but it's not the only thing that the Fed is looking at, of course. So can you maybe shed some light on other data points that the Fed may be considering as it considers its path forward? Absolutely. But I, can I add something prior to that? And that is 
the Federal Reserve alone cannot solve the problems that we face. The administration has got to work within the confines and together with the Federal Reserve to effectively reach the conclusion they desire. What I mean by that is our national debt has gotten out of control. I think we're at 31 trillion. We've hit the debt ceiling. And if the past is any indication, it will be resolved as an 11th hour move by Congress after they've stuffed that bill with as much uh, extraneous stuff as they can do to please their constituents because it is political year. You know, one of the things I talked about on an interview that I did just uh, an hour ago was that these aren't civil servants anymore. They're self-serving people in Washington. And so the main thing is that the Federal Reserve can do so much. They cannot solve this by themselves. So if they do all the right steps, but the government keeps spending more than they have and printing money, it's going to be uh, an impossible task to accomplish what they're, they're, they're trying to do. And so the most important thing that I believe the Federal Reserve is looking at, back to your question, is whether or not the administration pitches in and actually helps solve the problem or if they make that a harder problem to solve. Because besides the, the data points they're looking at, the key, the absolute thing that has to happen is it has to be a plan that is a combination of action by the administration, the House, the Senate, and the President, and the Federal Reserve to help poor Janet Yellen out that can't pay our bills. And so that's what they're gonna look at, and that's what is needed the most to come to a solution in a timely manner that ha inflicts the least amount of pain on, on citizens here. Yeah, you know, I remember in that conversation we had about a year ago, you emphasized at that time as well that, you know, some things are beyond the Fed's control. It can't fight inflation alone. And right. a topic that we touched on then was supply chain issues. So I was going to check in with you on that and their bearing on inflation as well at the moment. Well, th listen, we came out of a unique period in time in which we were self-isolated pretty much for a year, a year, a year and a half, we had a global shutdown. It was a black swan event in that it, I'm pretty old, I'm 67, and I never experienced the kind of turmoil that came out of the whole thing that happened. And so it's a difficult solution. It calls for serious answers, but I don't believe that it can be solved by itself, but most importantly, to answer your question, I don't think supply chain bottlenecks have anything to do with the problem right now. I think that that has worked itself out of the system. I believe the biggest problem was a mistake by the Federal Reserve early on when they incorrectly assumed that inflation was transitory. Because I believe in 2020, I think it was around May, was the first time inflation went above their 2% target. It came in at 2.6%. Had they began incremental rates at that point, I think that by March 2022, when the first rate hike actually occurred, there would not have been a need. They would have solved the problem. And so that everything they did after that huge, huge blunder was um, corrective and it was uh, triage, so to speak. It was trying to undo what they should have done before. And that is what got us to the point where we are at now. I've taken a little bit of heat because I put that in a few articles and I said, oh no, you don't understand inflation. What I do understand is the Fed can do so much and historically speaking, Every bout of relatively high inflation was met with a Fed with one single strategy, put interest rates to approximately the rate of inflation. We didn't have our first rate hike till eight and a half percent, and we raised it by a quarter percent. It's going to have a, a minimal effect, if any effect, unless you do it for a long period of time. And that's why 
the the narrative of the Fed is this is not going to get solved quickly. We're not going to reduce rates uh, throughout 2023. Now they're talking about raising the uh, the target from 5.1 percent to 6 percent. Everything they're doing is correcting the mistake of not acting soon enough, and that's already happened. I believe what they're doing now is on point, but they should have done it earlier. They didn't. And so what that means is it will take longer. We will see rates elevated probably throughout the year. I don't believe we will see a rate cut. And the interesting thing is that the investing public didn't believe that. Oh, they can't sustain it, which was something that I personally thought wouldn't be possible. But they, the stock market kept going up. The reaction was that what they're saying one thing, but they're just it. They're just speaking a doctrine, and they don't think that they can pull that off. I believe they have the resolve because intrinsically they know without these steps now, um, inflation will become entrenched. And so, I think they're on the right path. I think that what they're doing is needed. And I think the people that are going to pay for it are the middle class of Americans, Canadians, and we're a intermixed global society now and with global economic connections. It's not only felt from one continent to the next, it's felt around the world. And the problems that inflation has brought globally are going to be sustained for a while. And lastly, my real concern is that at some point inflation will be sticky again as i brought up last year there's certain things they can't control energy and food costs now they said food costs have come down i question that because i i don't see it i see food costs going up but maybe it's where i live or uh, because hawaii is not the least expensive place and also we don't really we import everything so it could be a that difference, but from what I've heard from people living on the mainland, living in Canada, it's still entrenched. And my fear is that there will come a point in which they've done everything they can and what remains are the particular items in and that are causing inflationary pressure that they really can't address. And if that happens, what do they do? And that's, I, I don't have an answer for that. And I pray that I'm wrong because that would be a very difficult scenario to kind of work through. And then lastly, again, I bring up the fact that without the administration tightening their belt and, and not getting us deeper in debt, but having some long-term plan to bring that down to where we spend on things that are essential and cut, uh, how do the politicians put it, the fat out of the bills, the pork fat, they have to be realistic and they have to change. And there's really no motivation for them to do that because we can just print money and they're not the ones that suffer because of it. It is the hardworking middle-class American, Canadian, um, English, I mean, it's a global problem. And that's my concern. It is really concerning. I think you've made a lot of points that will resonate with people a lot around the world. And what I wanna ask now is how this relates back to gold because our audience has a strong interest in gold and precious metals. And I think the performance that we've seen from gold over the last year or so, maybe not so much in the last few months, but it's, it's confused people a little bit who think perhaps the price should be higher and they wonder what's going on there. You know, I think that it, gold is act in a superlative manner. First of all, we if you look at back to last year, we saw gold rise tremendously up until March 2022. That was the moment that the first rate hike was implemented. Then a series of rate hikes gives us a multi-month correction. We had a triple bottom that began around September to November at around $1,620. But consider this, from November to just about a week ago, it moved from 1600 to close to 2000 almost a $400 move. We only had one shallow correction. It moved from 16 to 18 and then came back down to 1720 
And then it was not parabolic, but it was a very, very aggressive tact to gain pricing, which is why I feel that the correction we're seeing is long overdue. Now, I have been on record stating I think that gold will go to a new all-time record high this year. I said that, I stick by it, but I question if it will be if gold will be able to reach those highs this year. But I do feel this right now, market participants, gold investors are focusing on rising rates and not inflation. Inflation is coming down. And so it is a climate in which rising rates is a bearish influence on gold. And inflation is a bullish influence on gold. So you've got that push pull. But if I am correct, and I'm not the only analyst out there that believes parts of inflation will remain sticky and very difficult to deal with. If that happens, then sentiment will turn to focus on the level of inflation that's not being reduced rather than the interest rates because they're, they can only take it so high. And at that point, we will see a tremendous price ascent in gold. Will it go to an all-time record high? I said it. That doesn't mean it'll happen because things have changed, but I believe it is possible maybe by Q1 of next year. But the key is that shift will come when market participants focus on inflation not being reduced to the level they thought it was or the, at the rate it was, and it will be due to some items being sticky. In other words, they, they don't have the tools to control it. If that occurs, we will see gold take off. But for those that say we haven't seen the performance we should, we had a $400 rally between November and now. If that's not exceptional performance, I can only point to maybe one or two times in history where we had that kind of move in gold. I think they became so sour about it hitting $10 shy of the all-time high 2078 in March and then going down to 1600. It did that in a year. Remember what happened in the middle of 2011? Ran to 1910, all-time record high. And everyone, including myself, figured, okay, 2000 is just, that's the next stop. And we had a multi-year correction. Okay, 2013, 14, 15. And it wasn't until the end of 2015, beginning of 2016, when gold ran to $1,020 from 1920, it, it lost half of its value. Then we saw a return to a multi-year bull market. So when you put it into perspective, yes, we had a pretty strong correction, but the rationale behind it was we had rate hikes at every single FOMC meeting, seven consecutive meetings, four of them being three quarter percent rate hikes. That's a hard pill to swallow for, for any asset that does, that has a negative impact on rising rates, that's gold. And to have that many rate hikes, I think it held up rather well. And the incredible strong rally that started in November, 400, typical rally, I've been doing this and studying gold for about 30 years. We expect a good rally to be 100, an exceptional rally to go up 150 to $200. And that's been kind of the model that we've worked with for years. So whoever is upset with how it's moved, consider it's moved $400 in just a matter of months. And if you focus on that, I find it hard pressed to make that same statement. I think that's true. I think people do tend to maybe sometimes lose the context. So that that was a very helpful explanation of how you see it. And I want to ask just briefly as well about silver and your thoughts on silver in 2023, because it, it follows gold, but it also has its own set of drivers that are a little bit separate as well. I did an interview a couple of weeks ago and I was asked that question and I said, silver is a different animal. That was the words I used. There's obviously been a disconnect between the tandem moves in gold and silver. It used to be that when gold moved up, silver moved up and typically outperformed gold. On the way down, the percentage loss was greater in silver than gold, but they tend to move in tandem. 
that disconnect has widened. And so we see days where gold might go up or silver might go down. There are different factors that you have to look at in silver. First of all, I think that overall, there's always going to be more of a demand because the idea of using silver and solar, electric cars, the applications are tremendous. And as that green technology grows, silver is an essential component. And so it doesn't seem to be sensitive to inflation in the way it used to be. I used to think of silver as gold's little sister. Uh, so they both ran, they were both sensitive to inflation. Gold doesn't have the type, the amount of applications that silver has, which is why I believe that it has upside potential. But here's my problem with that. Gold, silver went to $50 in two occasions. And the last one was record high in gold, record high in silver. Every record high after that, when gold went to an all time high, silver peaked out at 30. Why? I, I can't answer the question, but that to me is odd. And so that tells me, I'm hoping that if gold goes to an all time record high, we see silver go to 40, 42. But will it go to an all time record high? It hasn't. And since it's a, a very difficult explanation to, to ascertain why that happened when the fundamentals behind silver should with increased demand should elevate that price. It's a more difficult answer. My only thing and I'm speculating on this is they mine a lot more silver than gold. I mean, you got to go back to supply and demand. One of the reasons might be although you've read stories about how there's not enough silver. My sense is that there's more than enough silver. It's it. They're both mined in the same uh, pit. So silver and gold come out of the same mines. But I think it's the production, and I don't have those numbers. But that would be the only thing that really made sense to me about why silver didn't go to all time highs when gold did. Is that the production is so great? Because when you look at something like palladium or platinum that come out of South Africa and Russia, it's not far fetched to realize why palladium, which I remember at $100 an ounce became the most valuable precious metal. Again, it's scarcity. And I think the opposite might be true for silver, but I don't have the facts to back it up. But if I had to guess, I would think that that would be a big factor. Okay, really interesting. And that, that could be something to look into further in the future. That's all I have for you today. This was really great. I think you articulated a lot of points that will be helpful for investors in the precious metal space. But was there anything, any final thoughts that you would add for, for people heading into the year? Yeah. When you invest in gold or silver, there's traders and physical accumulators. And the dollar is never going to be worth more than it is today. Tomorrow, they're printing more and more money. Currencies worldwide are on a race to zero, they're, to devalue their currency. Long term, gold has always held up with a big lag to inflationary pressures. And the story I like to tell is if you had a $20 gold piece and a $20 bill, they were gold certificates, by the way, um, let's say in 1910, you could take that gold coin or that dollar bill, that $20 bill, you could buy a brand new suit or dress for a woman, you could have a weekend at the plaza, you could buy a steak dinner and pay for it all with a, either one of those, the $20 gold piece or the $20 bill. Now, when we look at current pricing, if you have a $20 coin, no numismatic value, only the value of gold, which is around $1,800, and a $20 bill that has a value of about $20, for $1,800, you could still buy a reasonably nice suit. I've checked, you could still get a room at the plaza, maybe not a suite, and the steak dinners back then were $1.50, let's say they're 100 now. In other words, that gold coin had the same buying power then as it does now. And the dollar bill has a fraction of that value. What is that? You know, four cups of Starbucks coffee. So in the long run, when you look at the big picture, 
people say, well, it doesn't really keep up with inflation. And I would tend to point out the fact that it's not a one, it's not a very high correlation year to year, day to day. But the fact is gold has the same buying power it had 100, 200 years ago. And the dollar has a, a, a fraction of that buying power for those that invest in gold. A, I don't believe in numismatics unless you're cousins with the guy grading it because there's so much variation, but gold will always, it's the oldest form of currency on earth. It has intrinsic value, it had intrinsic value, and I believe it always will have intrinsic value, continue to accumulate. I am on a silver kick now, but I mean the gold and silver that I'm accumulating, it's for my kids anyways, I'm not gonna sell it. I like to look at it, but what I would say is don't worry about the day-to-day, month-to-month fluctuation. If, you, if you're not investing in, uh, right now, fixed income is pretty good. Real estate's a little iffy because of the high mortgage rates. But don't give up on accumulating gold and don't look at it as a short-term investment because it's always the right time to buy gold. As long as you realize that 10, 20 years from now, there's going to be the gold is is going to be have far more buying power and value than whatever happens to the dollar. And okay. that's what I that's what I think um, investors in gold need to understand and not get worried about the minutia of it's going up or it's going down. It's not performing. It is performing over time. There's nothing that is done better than that except maybe land, but there, there's no liquidity there. But there's never been any asset that has kept the same buying power for hundreds of years. So there's something right about gold. There's a reason that it was the first currency and it's still in use today. And anytime you doubt the resolve of your purchases of physical gold that you hold on to, think about that story and realize there's never a wrong time to buy. It's just allocate the right amount. I think that's a great thought to leave investors with, you know, to keep thinking long-term, to remember your purchasing power. I think those examples were really helpful. So thank you so much for joining me today to go over what's going on in the markets and what we might see coming ahead. Always a pleasure, always a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Of course, and hope to see you again. Once again, I'm Charlotte McLeod with the Investing News Network, and this is Gary Wagner with thegoldforecast.com.